regardless, uh, this, this toolbox that I'm going to give you today is really very special. It's a, it's a way of, of evaluating technical innovation. So you got, you, uh, you're given a proposal, you're given a, 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 a business plan, you're given, you know, you're given um, a project idea from, from a, a bunch of engineers and you want to, and you want to, you want to figure out if this is, if this is a good investment or if this makes sense uh, to you. Um, the flip side is probably going to be just as important for you guys when you have a great idea and you're going off and you're seeking money for it. Um, you'll end up having to write some kind of a proposal or plan planning document and that could either be internal at your company or it can be to a government agency for a for a research proposal or or, or it could be a, 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 the beginning of a pitch to a um, to a to a uh, an angel investor or a venture capitalist. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to walk through something called the, the Heilmeier catechism, um, which sounds like a mouthful and it is, but it's also a wonderfully refreshing piece of common sense, uh, very clearly articulated um, that allows you to both frame and evaluate technical innovation. So here's, Here's um, kind of the beginning of the, of, 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 of the setting of things. That is George Hellmeyer uh, in, you know, late in life. Uh, uh, he died early, he died fairly young, um, not too long ago. Uh, he was, um, for reasons we'll see, he, he passed away in Plano, Texas. He considered Dallas one of his homes. Was, um, and uh, um, he came up with a brilliant way, simple way of figuring out how to, how to frame an argument and how to evaluate, uh, how do you know if an idea deserves funding? And that idea can be your idea, right? How do you know, you're, hopefully you guys are gonna have a, a, a surplus of ideas, more ideas, more innovations, more inventions than you have time to pursue. So how do you figure out which ones um, you should go after? How do you prioritize? And so Hammeyer um, was very, very influential in, 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 um, in, this, in, this, um, in this exercise. So who was he? Well, he was born in Philadelphia. Um, and I, I love this. He was, he was the son of a janitor. So not from, not from, you know, not from wealth, not from privilege. Uh, he did very, very well in high school in Philadelphia. And he got a uh, scholarship to study engineering at University of Pennsylvania. Um, he graduated from there and went on to uh, Princeton. He, got, he ended up getting a PhD at Princeton University, plus a couple of other weird degrees as well. So he already has sort of a perspective on things. And then do you remember um, Radio Corporation of America, David Sarnoff um, in The Empire of the Air? You guys remember that? The, the broadcast, the history of broadcast radio? Yes. Yeah, so, so Sarnoff Labs, or actually at the time it was called um, uh, uh, RCA Labs, Radio Corporation of America Labs, um, was, a, was a pretty big government, pretty big industrial laboratory. Uh, they, they had a lot of fees uh, off of the patents and they put, a fair, they put almost all those fees, all the, all the um, licensing revenue from those into a research laboratory. And one of the things that he did in the, in the, in the mid 60s, the 1960s, um, was he was the inventor of something called the liquid crystal display. And if you're sitting in front of your laptop, odds are that laptop is a liquid crystal display. Um, and, you know, it was, it was absolute, it was a, um, it was the, you could also say that he was the inventor of the flat panel display. Uh, in the old days, you're, you had uh, uh, CRTs, uh, television sets, that went back uh, probably as deep, went back as deep as they were wide. Um, and so very big bulky things, very big heavy things. I recently had to move one of those out of my mom's upstairs. And boy, I, 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 my muscles hurt for days. It was, it was ridiculous and I had help, um, but it was, it was just a nuisance to try to get that huge box down the, the steep stairs. Um, so this was this was particularly salient, and you can you could you know why, uh, in, our, in from looking at that PBS documentary, you know why that he was why RCA was interested in it, 
And there's a picture of, of um, Hallmeyer in front of one of his displays doing a video NTSC test pattern. Um, and so, and, and so they, were, they were very interested in, in all, all technologies that might lead to uh, television sets. Um, and so this, so that was that was one of the that was what he was doing. So really, a, a very interesting, um, uh, great invention, uh, very very impactful even today, and done fairly early at 1964. Um, of course, it took a long time for for uh, things to really um, uh, become manufacturable and and uh, work out all the all the little tricks of the trade on it. But but absolutely seminal piece of research. And then in 1970. He went to Washington, D.C. Um, he started off as a White House fellow in science. And um, eventually, in, in, in the mid-70s, he um, became the director of something called the DARPA. I mean, I have a slide up of DARPA in a, in a second. Now, he was only at DARPA for a couple of years, but he was incredibly influential at DARPA. Um, he pioneered a lot of things, such as um, stealth technologies for airplanes, um, and 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 um, and uh, artificial intelligence, which is uh, you know now is recognized as one of the key pieces of big data, um, and so on. Uh, then then um, then he came down, and this is where this is where he began um, his uh, his um, his love of Texas. He was uh, the vice president, and then later the chief technical officer of Texas Instruments, and that's where many of us got to know him um, uh, late in his career. Uh, at, at Texas Instruments. Um, then he went back to New Jersey and became CEO of something called Bellcor, which was a piece of the Bell telephone company empire uh, just after the breakup of, of this. Uh, Bell, the Bell telephone company used to be a government um, sanctioned monopoly, uh, basically a utility company. They, and then, um, and then uh, a Texas company um, Challenged that in court and broke the back of that monopoly, and for and forced a divestiture into um, regional telephone companies, and and a long distance research arm. and And Belcor was the long distance research arm. AT&T was the successor out of this, correct? Uh, Samir, what, do, what would you repeat that? AT&T was the successor out of this. Yes, yes. What happened? Like, like what happened? Samir was that you had seven of these baby bells, and basically the one that had the the one that ended up with the most uh, profitable region uh, was able to devour and take over uh, um, all the, you know the others, and so so it, it was a little bit like a Game of Thrones. I, I haven't watched too much of that show. I read the book actually, but I haven't watched the show on TV. But you know, you had all these, you had all these uh, baby bell companies, regional companies, and because they controlled the revenue, um, they were able, they were strong, and then and then the strongest of the one would eat would eat the weakest of the one, and so over over decades you had this industry consolidation, and Samir, you're absolutely right. Um, two remain, uh, one is Verizon and one is AT and T, um, and so. And so that so, and I think it's really fascinating that that, that whole thing started with um, with uh, Arthur Collins here in town at Collins Radio. Um, I didn't know about the I didn't know about Verizon, but I knew that AT and T acquired all of them. Yes, yeah, they they um, Verizon Verizon was did have uh, Verizon came actually out of MCI, um, Macaw Craw. and Verizon was actual that the the heritage of Verizon was actually the company. That um, that illegally operated a a, a long distance company, um, fixed wireless from um, from St. Louis to Chicago, and they and they scraped off the high revenue margin business traffic. And if you if you drive around town, you'll see these very these giant um, uh, antennas all in a row. Um, and they have these these um, they have these this uh, these horn antennas on them, um, and and you, you'll you'll see them. They're they're spaced every five ten miles or so, five miles or maybe ten miles or so, and those are line of sight RF links. And that's exactly the technology that the Macaw Craw, then uh, which became MCI, which became Verizon. Um, and so I find it interesting that both Verizon and AT and T are in us big presence. 
uh, because of our telecom, our radio um, history, and, um, and, and, the, and, the, and they're still competing against each other. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole, that's a fascinating story that blends technology with business, with markets. Really, you know, you, you, you really, um, um, yeah, it's really an, a very interesting um, uh, 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 history. And uh, I have a couple people in mind um, that I'm going to bring in in the over, you know, when, when campus opens up, we get back going again. I've got a people, I've got a few people in mind that can help us tell the story of that and get some more videos, um, video cases for this. So Helmeyer was a, was a, was absolutely a genius, absolutely frank, absolutely common sense, a high performer throughout his entire career. Um, and I, he only spent two years at DARPA, but he was incredibly influential at DARPA. And, and so I think it's worth spending a spending moment and understanding what is DARPA and why is it so special? Um, have any of you heard of, of DARPA? Sometimes yes. it gets, Samir, have you? Yes. Where did you hear about it, Samir? Um, the first time I heard about it was like in fourth grade, but it was like a government, government project. Like it was highly advanced and focused on technology that stuff that's here today. So it's um, it gets mentioned a lot. It gets mentioned from time to time on um, in in movies and television shows, and they they sort of, they have the reputation and it's well deserved that these are the mad scientists of the of the government research arm. Um, and uh, and that's probably true. That's probably true. Um, they, it's DARPA stands for Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So the if you think through that name, uh, advanced research is at, is at its heart, uh, arranged into projects. So it's not just open ended research. It has to have a beginning and an end and a middle. Um, has to have a success and a failure, or you know, parts you know has to have either success or failure. Um, and there's a D in DARPA, which stands for defense. And so that's very much about national security. And with this, and so 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 over the years, the D has been a little a big D, a little D, and and even a few years it wasn't even there. Um, but but mostly it, it was about, it's about national security. And, and what happened was there, there was, how many of you have heard of this, of Sputnik in 1957? So it was a big, big, big deal. Um, it was at the, it was at the, it was during the early days of the Cold War. Um, and the, and, and the USSR, the Soviet Union, launched the first uh, orbiting satellite. And it wasn't much, but a little tin box, uh, but it had a radio beacon in it. And the radio beacon, uh, the radio beacon um, uh, beeped, you know, every, and so when it flew over the U US, uh, at, you know, ham radio operators and government um, operators could listen and hear this beep. And it was really just sort of this ominous signal that, that the, the 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 Soviet Union uh, was 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 having a presence uh, way overhead, and so it caught the U.S. as a surprise, and so they formed the defense uh, they formed DARPA uh, to to prevent future surprises, to prevent fu to prevent future surprises. So they wanted, in fact, what they wanted to do is they wanted to um, become the surpriser. They they want not they wanted they wanted to be the ones that if there was going to be a, a a surprise in the balance of power a technological surprise in the balance of power across the across the globe they wanted they wanted it they wanted to be that that um, uh, uh, that instigator um, and again you have to, you you have to think through the mindset of of a, of a population around the world that was coming to grips with. Um, First atomic, uh, first atomic uh, bombs, and then and then nuclear bombs, um, and 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 so and so really very much a um, 
uh, trying to figure out um, where the world was was um, was headed. Um, so DARPA, DARPA throughout its years uh, drives absolutely transformational change. It, it, it is it is a hotbed of, of intense technological creativity. Um, and they, we talk about DARPA hard problems and DARPA hard problems are problems that um, that dramatically change um, dramatically change the landscape. Um, so, and, and DARPA, by the way, has only about 200, only a couple hundred people uh, on, and, and most of those people are temporary. Uh, most of those people just orbit in and out um, on a tour of duty, uh, either from um, government laboratories, universities, or, um, or, or, uh, uh, or um, uh, corporate laboratories. Um, and over the years, they've come up with things like the global positioning system, the GPS that you all we all rely on uh, in our phones. Um, they, they came up with the Saturn V rocket. Uh, they came up with stealth technology. That was, that was directly under, um, under Hellmeyer. Uh, they came up with artificial intelligence. And again, that was, that was back in the 70s. Uh, that began back in the 1970s um, under Hellmeyer. Uh, they, they, they pioneered the translation of, of one, one language into another. And again, that's, that, that's a nice, those, some of those are really nice examples of, um, of uh, things that help, things that help um, stabilize the world and therefore are directly uh, linked to national security um, without, without, without warfare. You know, if you can understand other people's languages better, the odds of, of, a, of a miscommunication go down. So, th so that's the kind of thinking that, that, they, that um, they pioneered. They also, they also pioneered a lot of these autonomous vehicles. Um, uh, there, are, there are autonomous vehicles, self-propelled, self-guided uh, vehicles that are, that are in the sky, um, under the sea, and um, we're very much aware of the ones on land. So we have a, I've had a long history with DARPA um, as, a, as, a, as what they call a performer. Um, I've, had, I've been a co-PI on three uh, DARPA grants. Um, these, are, these are huge um, for university research. These are fairly large. The one that we're working on now at SMU um, is, uh, is to build a camera that can see around a corner. And that's an example of a DARPA hard problem. How can you build a camera that can see around a corner. Uh, how can how can you read the light that um, is reflected and scrambled on a piece of drywall? Um, but that but that's why it's DARPA hard. It's it's arranged. It's it's the project is uh, is shaped and framed into something that's that where only good things are going to come out. So it, there's a lot of there's a lot of lessons on on uh, technology innovation and, and commercialization that you can get out of DARPA. So, what we're going to talk about is um, the what's called the Heilmeier Catechism. Uh, there's a there's a nod in there. He was a very religious person, um, and so and so it, it kind of made sense to dress up what he was doing. His his criteria is another is sort of a, a quieter way of saying it, but most people think about this as a catechism, which is which is a, a doctrine, um, and and so there are a list of questions that comprise the Heilmeier criteria. And so what you're trying to do when you're evaluating a technology, your own or others, when you're trying to sell your own technology or evaluate it, you, what you wanna do is go through these questions and uh, one by one and see where you get, see where you are at the end of that. Um, the first one is, what are you trying to do? Articulate your objectives, um, using absolutely no jargon. So if you think about autonomous vehicles, that's a little jargony, right? That's a, that's, that's, that's not, that, those are words that you have, you have to stumble over. If you think about stealth technology or artificial intelligence, those, those are a little bit clearer. You know, those, those phrasings are a little bit clearer. So right off the bat, you've got a government, a government bureaucracy and part of that, part of that 
operation was saying, don't use any jargon. Be really, really clear. Don't, you know, no, um, no obfuscation. Um, so the next question is, how is, it, how is it done today? And what are the limits of the current practice? In other words, why can't we just go on doing what we're doing uh, the way we've always been doing it? Uh, language translation, for example. Um, before it was on Google, before it was uh, was part of a of a of a computational um, or signal processing perspective, um, we had we had um, uh, dictionaries. So if you wanted to translate something from Spanish to English, you'd get out a, a Spanish to English dictionary, and you'd go word for, for word, and you would look up the word, and you'd puzzle out what um, what what that what that was eventually you would memorize some of the words and, and eventually you would you would um you would uh be a little faster at it but that's an example of before and after uh how is it done today and what are the limits of current practice um what's new in your approach and why do you think it'd be successful so usually with darpa usually with these things even even vcs even new new technology startups that are small you're trying to do improvement. So why why other other bright people are out there? Why weren't they? Why weren't why didn't why weren't they successful? So why you and not and not these other really smart people that are out there? So you better so you might you might have something new that other people haven't thought of, and and um and that and and then you should explain what that what's new. And why why that's going to lead to success where other people have failed? Um, who cares? You know, if you're successful, what difference will it make? So that's sort of a market relevance. There's plenty of research out there that is absolutely gorgeous, absolutely beautiful, um, but maybe um, but maybe uh, it's just esoteric. Uh, so so DARPA wants to fund relevant stuff. Um, VCs want to fund marketable stuff. Um, engineers generally like to be to to make a difference, to be impactful, and so so articulating exactly what what you know who would care about this and why why the, why you will make a difference in the world. Um, what are the risks and what are the paths? Uh, DARPA is one of the few agencies that celebrates risk in a in a way that that that. Um, other other companies, other other funding agencies don't. Um, so they, so everything you do will have a risk associated with it. The the difference is what's risk versus reward. How do you balance those two things? Are they are they in balance? Are you taking on a disproportionate risk of success um, without any payoff, or are you are you are you shooting for something that's too easy? Um, so and other and other people might want to do that, uh, even in a VC setting. If you take on something too easy, um, other people will just other people will see what you're doing and just just flood into the marketplace, and you won't have a you won't have any uh, barrier to entry. And then the, the some profit stuff. How much will it cost? How long will it take? So so you can see that these questions are fairly comprehensive, but it's not a long list. You can see that um, uh, what are the midterm and final exams to check for success. So the last couple of these is a pro are project management audiences. Uh, some of the other ones are market based. Uh, some of the other ones are appeal to the pure science and technology of things. And so that's very reminiscent of selling into a, a an engineering environment where you've got a lot of a lot of different perspectives that all come to the table. To evaluate um, your the uh, the opportunity, and so here's here's the here's this this slide here is really um, your key takeaway, and I hope you do um, uh, uh, keep it in mind. Uh, as long as you can spell Halmeyer, which is no easy feat, um, you can always Google these and find out a little bit more about Halmeyer, find out a little bit more about the Catechism. Um, we you know we teach this. Um, we teach this to new professors um, that are coming into to SMU, uh, and we want them to be we want them to be successful in their research. They want themselves to be successful in their research, 
And so we, we have workshops um, where, we, where we teach them uh, this, um, this, this, this Heimeyer Catechism and how they might use that to pick which proposals they want to pursue and how to frame those proposals in the best light. So, so this is not, this is by no, this is simple, straightforward, and I think, I think understandable, but it's also not, it's, it's also fairly sophisticated. It, we're, this is, this, this is something that I think you guys can appreciate and, and, and even, um, even faculty members, um, early career faculty members uh, um, find this absolutely useful. So what I want to do, what I want to do is I want to turn this a little bit more into interaction. Um, and I want, what I've done is I've, I've come up with an example and I, and I tried to pick an example. Um, this did actually come out of DARPA. Uh, this is part of that autonomous vehicles, um, which is, e which is, which is less guard, less jargon, autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars. So, so, what I, so let's see. Um, what, I, what I have here is an example. Does everyone know what a self-driving self car is? Have people heard of that problem? Lauren? Yes. Can you give us... Do you, can you give us some examples of, of a, where, you've, where you've heard that? Um, for example, Tesla is working on that. Yep. Yep, in a Tesla car, and it's, and it's controversial, right? In a Tesla car, you can, you can um, become distracted. You can just turn over control of the car to, to itself, and there's all these sensors that sense cars around each other. There's GPS in there that allows it to to, to get off at the right exit. Um, and, and so for limited engagements, you can, you can read a newspaper while you, while you uh, barrel down 75, you know, on, the, on your way to work. Um, so that's an example of, of, a, of a pretty sophisticated self-driving car. Um, so what, when this was pitched at DARPA, um, when this was pitched at DARPA, um, you know, the, just framing this as self-driving trucks and self-driving cars was, um, was already um, pretty low jargon. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this question in a slightly different way because I happen to know the problem that they were facing at the time that this came out. Um, and what they were what they were doing is they were in Iraq, and they had to move uh, supplies um, around that war zone. And what was going on? And this was this was highlighted in the press: a huge a huge um, threat to our to soldiers uh, were these improvised um, explosive device these uh, these these. Uh, landmines that were that were hacked together by the by the opposing forces and so what so what they would do is they'd have these ieds and they, they would go off and and uh and they'd kill and cripple the the crew inside of the truck and you know if you had to move people around that was one thing but but most of the time that you were out there you were actually moving supplies around uh, so the so so if you could get the um, if you could get the, the soldiers out of the truck, um, then we, then if you if you um, if you uh, if the truck blows up by an IED, you can um, you, you they, they, those 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 people won't be killed. Um, now, you know, it was this is a beautiful example of nonlinear thinking. Um, if you you know the. 90 percent of the of the of the researchers that were thinking through this problem were were, were answer, answering questions like um, how do I detect the IEDs? Um, a lot more were saying, well, let's what what can we can we can we can we build, put more metal 
onto the undercarriage of our of our trucks, so that so that the uh, the troops will have more protection in, when when the IED strikes. So so that's those are those are straightforward um, uh, answers to those questions. And then it takes it takes some some nonlinear thinking to say, well, wait a minute, what do we care about? Do we care about people or do we care about the trucks? And and um, and maybe we don't have to worry about you know, if we care more about the people than the trucks, then let's just get these, let's just, let's get, just get these trucks to drive themselves. So, so that's, uh, that's an answer that I offer here. Um, you can see that that answer actually could also go under uh, the who cares, you know, the who cares question. Um, so that's sort of, you, you know, and I'm, and I'm not going to argue one is better than the other, but, but um, I chose to put it under the first one. Um, uh, uh, just, just uh, for this, for this go round, for this go round. Um, all right. So the next question is, how's it done today, and what are the limits of current practice? And I'm not going to answer this yet until I hear two or three ideas from you guys. So go back in time when there was no, no, when we we didn't have Teslas, um, we had to. Uh, we had to we had to drive ourselves around um, school buses and, and carpools for many of you when you were young. So how might you answer this question, Emma? Everything is human controlled, so. Um, it's human error can cause problems or people like get tired or fall asleep or distracted and that would lead to accidents. Okay. Okay. Good. Very good. Uh, Jing, were there any examples um, from before on, on vehicles that were autonomous? Um, I have no idea about this. Okay. Um, who might I pick on? How, has anybody been to um, like a Six Flags or a or Disneyland or Disney World, an amusement park? What about UAVs? Yeah, let's talk about land-based, though, Samir. Or was that Rasik? Yeah, that was me, Rasik. Sorry, Rasik. No, you good. So, Rasek, have you been to an amusement park when you were young? Uh, yeah. Were you did Did you ever go on something that was autonomous, land based and autonomous, self driving? Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess yeah. Well, give me an example. Uh, like a roller coaster, maybe. That's a great example. That is a great example. Um, I remember. I remember when I was really, really young. Um, uh, they had these. Um, they had this ride at, at, at I think Disneyland, and you would get in, and you'd be in. A, you'd be as a really, really little kid. You'd be in the driver's seat of this car, and you could wiggle your wheel, wiggle the steering wheel around, and that, and have all kinds of fun with it. But at the end of the day, it was on a track. And the track was either a carriage underneath it, or it, or it was a, um, it was a, it was a, a, a detent in the in the concrete path, and so it was it was very much self drive. It was it was a primitive example of of a self driving ride, uh, but but uh, it, there was no intelligence, no no nothing about it, and so you you had things like uh, yo I forgot you also had these these. Um, these little toys, right? Uh, that you would get at Radio Shack. I don't know if any of you have these remote control cars, and you know where you had a where you could um, you could you could drive them uh, from afar. So so perhaps that could also fall under this category of of a of an autonomous vehicle, it's particularly if you were if one of your problems that you were chewing on at the time was um, uh, moving material around a dangerous environment. Like a like a um, a war zone or or a mine or something like that. Um, 
So, so you had um, you had examples of tracks. You had examples of remote control. Uh, very inflexible, very limited bandwidth. If you're if you want to build a a, a track across um, across uh, the desert of Australia, for example, to to bring a uh, mining gear, uh, I'm sorry, mining um, product down into this to where it's where it can be refined and more and and um, and more useful. Uh, that's that's an expensive proposition to um, to lay to layer in the the the, uh, the steel tracks. So could you do it on a more flexible basis um, and and uh, more intelligent? Okay, so. What's new in this approach, and why do you think it'll be successful? Um, anybody want to give this? This is a difficult question. You have to. You have to. You have to think through. Um, what's new, and what would be what? What's new in the approach, and why? Um, uh, why do you think it'll be successful? Anybody want to guess what the what the secret sauce here was? Is Zach in or is uh, is Matthew here? You feel yeah, I'm here. Oh yeah. Do you want to do you want to take a stab at this, Matthew? Um. I don't really have a good idea on this. Yeah, these are these are hard questions, right? You know, and and yeah. um. You know, I'll tell you from my own from my own experience, Matthew. Um, when I have one of my brilliant ideas that's maybe not as brilliant as I think it is at first blush, I usually can get through. Um, I can get through, you know, all but one or all but one or two of these, and that's when I know that I really the 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 one I can't answer is the one that that that's that's the big warning sign. That means that I haven't thought through the problem enough, right? So I think even if you went back to um, to the 1950s and 60s, uh, you probably had um, science fiction stories, you know, futuristic stories, movies where you had these uh, self-driving cars. Um, in fact, I've even seen pictures um, of, of you know artists' uh, uh, concepts of, of this. So what was really what was really germane about why now? Even more than GPS, because that had been around a while, was the ability was this artificial intelligence investments in artificial intelligence that began in the 1970s by the um, by the early 2000s had matured enough so that so that um, if you had if you could apply artificial intelligence to this problem, you could you could have a much 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 more robust system. So again, this this has to do with um, the general nature of the tension that you have across computing power, memory, um, and and bandwidth. So you needed enough you needed enough computing power, enough algorithms um, to pull all this stuff together for for um, this uh, to make a Tesla uh, be able to drive um, uh, down a freeway all by itself, which you know, is darned impressive. Um, who cares if you're successful? What difference will it make? Uh, I think Emma said sometimes Lauren says things safer war zones, safer roadways. Um, that was that was the point of the of the Tesla. Less human interactions and all those. Um, more economical movement of freight. So, so there's a fleet of, of trucks in Australia that take the mining product, and they go they go without they go hundreds of kilometers down these these uh, these roads uh, through through terrain that's just uninhabited, and instead of having a driver on those, the, all, most of those are are autonomous. They just they they navigate themselves down the roads. They they drive down the roads. So all of a sudden, you don't have to pay a driver. Um, and and uh, um, and so you can you have a much more economic uh, economical much cheaper movement uh, of this freight uh, again with less accidents less downtime uh, better better uh, um, better throughput 
Um, and then in a commercial setting, um, why why would I why would I turn over control of my um, car to to Tesla, to Tesla's brain? Well, maybe I want to read the newspaper. Maybe I want to um, work on my PowerPoint for um, the uh, the presentation that I'm going to do as soon as I get into work. So it frees up time for for um, for for their commuters. Um, what are the risks and payoffs? Rasik, do you want to you want to talk a little bit about this? Well, I think the risk is maybe it's not for the the whole riding because if there's the turn or something it's still very dangerous mm -hmm. there are there are certain there are certain pieces of the puzzle there are certain pieces of the puzzle that are prohibitively difficult um, the one that a lot of people are worrying about now are our intersections uh, particularly intersections uh, in a city, in a, in a city canyon, uh, where the buildings shield the, the, um, the ability to find a car uh, that's, that, that's come also coming to the intersection. So if you, if you have an intersection <coughs> on, in, with nothing around, then you can look at the angle and you can see the car coming with any kind of sensor um, LIDAR, radar, camera, what have you. But if, if the building blocks your view, um, you can't see it. So that's an example of certain special situations where you may not be able to, um, that you may, that may not be ready for prime time yet. Another type of risk would be like, if it did take over, like as driving as a taxi and stuff too, that would be a lot of job loss and um, for like, Uber drivers and taxi drivers as well. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's not a technical risk, but it certainly is an impact. Um, and 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 people will argue two things, right? People will argue, well, that's that's a that's a good thing, um, you know, to free up people from their labor. Um, that that was actually a dream of of um, of society, you know, a long time ago to to. Um, so you didn't have to do backbreaking work in the in the fields. You have more leisure time. That leisure time can make you a better um, a better uh, citizen, a voter, a, a, a more fulfilling life, and so on. Um, so so there are there's two sides of that. But I, I do I do agree with what you're saying. There's also people that say that you know getting into a strange Uber with a, with a stranger is is a risky situation, and so you're you're. Um, you're uh, you're opting that you're reducing that piece of the puzzle, so um, so you know you may make things less safe, right? The you, you may not have in the short run you may not have uh, um, the algorithms that you need to take into account all the all the settings. You know they they say that in this Tesla business that you should stay alert and be prepared to um, to step back in and take control, and that's really problematic. Because you know you may you may not you may the car may have things under control, but you don't re you don't recognize that you take back control before the car is ready for you to do that, and then you're fine. Then you're but you're in a hazardous situation for you uh, as a driver that the car might might um, might uh, might take um, place. So you may lack the processing power. You may lack the sensors. Um, for, for all the different things that you might want to do. Um, some of the payoffs here is you get better artificial intelligence for a wide variety of other applications. So an investment into this project uh, has, has rewards that are beyond this project. Oh my goodness, we're almost out of time. I'm so sorry, I, I got caught up with this. All right, let me wrap this up pretty quickly. Um, how much will it cost and how long will it take? A lot of times that depends on, on what, what you, how you frame the first generation of the project. Um, but generally speaking, you can get a handle on this by looking at, say, 
how many lines of code that you might have to do that takes you know takes a certain amount of time certain amount of people to do that what do you have to fabricate and test and how many iterations are you going to need to get to a, a tesla world um what are the midterm and final exams to check for success well darpa framed this really interestingly they had an obstacle course and they made it a contest so what they did was they they put out a um they put out a uh um there we go uh they put out a um a contest and so they had uh eight or nine teams build up build uh, uh cars and and they all had to make it around this obstacle course and of course the first year nobody really did there were signs of success on one versus the other uh and so they they had the contest they had a, this challenge again the year after and 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 many many more teams were successful and so that what they did over over a number of years they dangled the prize in front of all these um all these researchers and they were able to um and they were able to uh advance the art uh in year by year by year um iterations um fairly inexpensively as well so gee i'm really sorry we're